Welcome everyone to season three of National Park Service Presents. This is an online series that runs every other Wednesday at 6 p.m. We've been doing this since uh, January and we're gonna be running this to the end of April, April 26th. Um, this program covers a whole multitude of topics, um, but today is going to focus on Jay. Jay, here I am just switching names now. I'm so worried about the last name. I screwed up the first name. Today's, uh, tonight's topic will be about Jay Maycomb, Jane Maycomb. Um, and before we begin, and luckily I'm not the one giving the presentation. All right, Ranger Jane is so much more articulate than I am, but I'm gonna go over some of the Zoom features. Uh, we are recording, all right? So if you have friends who you know aren't here and you know they would really enjoy it, you can absolutely share the recording link. It's on the Boston Public Library YouTube page. It will not show up immediately. It'll probably show up in the next few days, um, but it will be there. You can also catch up on past, um, I guess, episodes, past lectures, um, and other past seasons. We recorded last season as well. You can also look at those. Um, if you're not enjoying the captions that you are seeing, you can absolutely turn those off. Click on the CC in the navigation bar and you can hit turn off subtitles. And in that navigation bar too, we have a chat button. All right, this is one of the rare places that we keep the chat open because you guys are so inquisitive and have such great questions um, that we want you to keep asking. So keep asking those questions. Don't be shy at all. We just ask you to be respectful of everyone. Uh, when you are asking your question, just notice who you're putting that question to. Either it goes to the panelists, which is myself, uh, Ranger Jane and Ranger Sean. Um, and if it's to everyone, it is everyone you see on screen and everyone back at home as well. Um, so just be aware of who you want to send it to. No worries. There's no correct way. It's just your own personal preference. Um, and at the very end of uh, the lecture tonight, a survey will pop up. If you could fill out the survey, that would be wonderful. That is how we continue to keep doing wonderful programs like this and keep knowing which ones to keep going with or which ones to phase out. Um, so your feedback is very, very important. So, oh, guys, I think that's the quickest I've ever done it. So without further nonsense from me, let's welcome Ranger Jane as she presents Jane Maycom, widow witness to the revolution in Boston. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us for this program. Uh, I am Ranger Jane Santea with the National Parks of Boston, and tonight's topic is Jane Maycomb, what a witness to the revolution in Boston. Uh, before we dive too deep into Jane's life, I do want to recognize the four scholars who have studied Jane. So we have Carl Van Doren, Jeremy Stern, Jill Lepore, and Richard Bell. And they pretty much make up the entire scholarship base regarding Jane Maycomb. So to tell you first a little bit about Jane's early life, Jane Maycomb was born on March 27th of 1712. And she grew up in a tiny four room house in the north end of Boston near the original Green Dragon Tavern pictured here. And her house was on the corner of Union and Hanover streets. And Jane was actually the last of 17 children born to a poor candle maker and his wife. And on July 27th of 1727, when she was just 15 years old, Jane married 23-year-old Edward Maycomb, who was a saddler. And Jane really tried her best to keep a record of the marriages and births and deaths in her family in a little book that she called her Book of Ages, which is pictured on this slide. Now, her husband Edward was from an incredibly poor background as well, and he was never particularly successful as his trade, um, in his trade as a saddler. So because of that, Jane and Edward actually lived with her parents for the first 10 years of their marriage. And in an effort to contribute to the household uh, and help her family stay above the poverty line, Jane began to take in boarders um, into that already 
cramped and hectic household. And Jane and Edward finally were able to strike out on their own in January of 1738, but this only lasted a very short time because like I said, Edward was not very successful at his trade and he was really struggling to make ends meet. So he ended up borrowing money from multiple people, including Jane's parents, specifically her father, and eventually found himself in debtor's prison. So because of that, the Maycombs moved back in with Jane's parents, not only because they really had nowhere else to go, but also so that Jane could care for her elderly and ailing parents. So by 1740, when Jane was 28 years old, she had already given birth to six children, which means that between caring for her parents, her children, and the boarders she had taken in, her days were incredibly full. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, what really sets Jane Maycomb apart from other lower class women in this time period, in these years leading up to the American Revolution? Well, that would be that over a hundred of her letters survive to this day. She was lucky to be literate, although later in this presentation, you'll see that um, she wasn't always the best with spelling, but she was literate, able to read and write. And because of these letters, we're provided with a very unique outline of the Re American Revolution as experienced by a poor widowed woman. And while these private letters show that she was attentive to the changing political climate in Boston starting around the 1760s, she was not very public about these political opinions. Unlike some other well-known women from that time period, like Mercy Otis Warren or Abigail Adams. And her shift was a large, or shift in political beliefs was largely a private matter, really only shared with the closest of friends and confidants. Um, the most notable of which was her brother who was closest to her in age, but this brother actually ran away from home when she was only 11 years old, and she would only see him in person about once every 10 years for the rest of their lives. But she did stay in contact with them for their whole lives. So some of her information about political current events in other places in the world, like London or Philadelphia, came from her brother, who she was staying in contact with. But she also got plenty of information on her own. She read local newspapers regularly, um, read political pamphlets, and she also owned at least 11 books, but clearly had borrowed, read, and um, referenced dozens more, um, as is exemplified in her surviving letters. Also, uh, Jane Maycomb was a member of the Brattle Street Church, whose minister Samuel Cooper was very well known in his own time for giving explicitly political sermons. So really overall, Jane's political opinions, again recorded through her letters, changed very, very slowly, kind of ebbing and flowing with the tide of events that were unfolding around her. But these political opinions were definitely and firmly her own. And her political metamorphosis really begins in the 1760s, starting with the passage of the Stamp Act. And this act required colonists to pay taxes on every page of printed paper that they used. This included newspapers and almanacs, pamphlets, broadsides, legal documents, playing cards, all of those sorts of things. And it was called the Stamp Act because of the government issued stamps on the taxed items. And as a result of this tax, Jane was faced with both public and personal turmoil during the summer of 1765. Her husband was actually on his deathbed at the same time that riots began to break out in Boston in response to the Stamp Act. And Jane was definitely convinced that this tax hike was an outrage. She wrote a letter to her brother with her feelings saying, the confusion and distress those oppressive acts have thrown us poor Americans into is indescribable by me. But at the same time, she really deplored the violent outbursts against the royal officials who were ordered to enforce this tax in Boston. Earlier that summer, 
the Sons of Liberty had organized mobs to intimidate the local tax collector, Andrew Oliver, into resigning his position. And in August of 1765, a mob actually attacked the home of Thomas Hutchinson, who was the Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts, and absolutely ransacked it, causing an estimated amount of damage of 2,200 pounds, which today would be the equivalent of a few hundred thousand dollars. Luckily, Hutchinson himself had managed to escape just before the mob arrived. And Jane actually sympathized with Hutchinson, saying, the Lieutenant Governor's sufferings, which all circumstances considered, was never equaled in any nation, our saviors only accepted. And like him, I am told he bore it, praying for his enemies at the instant they were persecuting him. So clearly, Jane is uh, a loyalist at this point, um, supporting the Lieutenant Governor, and she even suggested that Bostonians should be the ones responsible to reimburse Hutchinson for the damages to his estate. But like I said, that summer Jane was facing public and personal turmoil. And so on September 11th of 1765, Jane recorded her husband's death in her little book of ages. She wrote September 11, 1765. God sees meet to follow me with repeated corrections. This morning, three o'clock, died my husband in a steady hope of a happy hereafter. And she wrote to one of her friends saying, it pleased God to call my husband out of this troublesome world where he had enjoyed little and suffered much by sin and sorrow. So following her husband's death, Jane really struggled to make ends meet even more than she had in years prior to this. Now she had been taking in those boarders for years and years, some of them actually being low level politicians long, long before her husband's illness. But those boarders weren't supplying enough income to support the household on its own. So she had a smart idea. She set her mind to starting her own home run business with the help of her daughters by ordering fabrics and other fashionable English goods through her brother who was living in London and then reselling those goods to fashionable upper class ladies in Boston, hoping to make a slight profit. And her brother was generous enough to foot the bill for her first shipment of goods. So very, very generous. Unfortunately, Jane's timing for creating this business venture could not have been worse because the first shipment of those fashionable goods from London arrived just a few months before the colonists learned about the passage of the Townshend Acts. And the Townshend Acts are named after Charles Townshend, Charles Townshend Chancellor of the Exchequer, who is uh, pictured here on this slide. So the Townshend Acts were passed in the summer of 1767, and they included a new indirect tax imposed by the British Parliament on pretty much all goods imported into the American colonies. And the in this indirect tax would not be as controversial as the Stamp Act, which was a direct tax. But very unfortunately, this was not the case. Many colonists, especially in Boston, were still outraged over the Stamp Act, and many of them straight up refused to pay these new taxes, organizing boycotts of imported goods. And most unfortunately, women in particular were encouraged to support the boycott by making their own clothing rather than buying imported fashionable goods from London. So as a result of these boycotts, Jane's business failed within months. And she described this as being a little unlucky for her. And in a letter to the to her brother, she wrote, I should like to have those that do buy and could afford it should buy what little I have to sell. And again, unfortunately for Jane, she was facing public and personal turmoil, because in the midst of these new political troubles, Jane suffered another personal loss. On September 19th of 1767, she made her final entry into her book of ages, never writing another birth, marriage, or death in her little book. She wrote, died my dear and beloved daughter, Polly Maycomb. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. 
Oh, may I never be so rebellious as to refuse acquiescing and saying from my heart, blessed be the name of the Lord. In a letter that is now lost, she wrote, sorrows roll upon me like the waves of the sea. I am hardly allowed to fetch my breath. I am broken with breach upon breach, and I have now in the first flow of my grief been almost ready to say, what have I more? But God forbid that I should indulge that thought, though I have lost another child. God is sovereign, and I submit. And finally, trying to find some way to come to terms with this grief of losing another child, she wrote another letter to her brother. And she addressed this letter to him saying, my dear and only brother. Now remember, she was the last of 17 children. She was born with plenty of brothers and sisters. But in this letter that she wrote to her brother, she said, really my spirits are so much broken with this last heavy stroke of providence that I am not capable of expressing myself as I ought. Oh, my brother, she was everything to me. Every word and every action was full of duty and respect, and I never looked on her but with pleasure, except when she was sick or in trouble. How to make me easy and happy was what she had most at heart, and rather than give me pain, she concealed her own infirmities. It did so much more than she was able that it increased her disorder and hastened her end. So her daughter, Polly, had actually been helping her mother with that millinery business by sewing bonnets and caps and those sorts of things. And Jane really agonized over the possibility that Polly helping her with the millinery business had only worsened her daughter's illness. And she was sort of holding herself responsible for her daughter's untimely passing. So by this point, Jane was 55 years old, and all but one of her siblings had died, except for her brother, and she had lost seven of her 12 children, and she had already witnessed the deaths of multiple of her grandchildren. So while Jane was still processing the loss of her daughter and this grief, the revolution continued to unfold around her. A year after the passage of the Townshend Acts, parliaments attempted, Parliament attempted to punish the colonies for their boycotts and for the civil unrest that had begun. Bostonians were punished when the British government dissolved the Massachusetts legislature. And because of this, Jane's politically involved lodgers had really no reason to stay in Boston, which meant that Jane also lost that small source of income. And in response to the civil unrest in the town, Parliament also dispatched thousands of troops under the British Army to Boston to restore order. So between her business failure and the loss of her lodgers, Jane was becoming increasingly frustrated with how the British government was ruining her life and livelihood. Now, Parliament's decision to dispatch the British Army would, of course, only increase tensions in Boston caused by the series of taxes that they had been implementing over those past few years. And Jane herself was really displeased with the soldiers' presence, not because she felt disloyal necessarily, but more because many of these soldiers were ill-disciplined, and Jane Maycomb had really always abhorred disorder and violence. But in addition to that, her house was also in hearing distance of the barracks, meaning that she would have heard the soldiers drilling on Sundays, and she was a very devout Christian. So this would not have really gone over with her that the soldiers were not observing the Sabbath in a satisfactory way. Now, in September of 1769, Jane actually ventured out of New England for the first time in her life, hoping to visit some friends and some of her surviving children who had moved to other parts of the colonies. And during this absence from Boston, many townspeople became more and more frustrated with the soldiers' presence because between the soldiers taking local jobs to supplement their pay and just causing general disruption to daily life in the town, tensions were at an all-time high. And I think we all know where this is going to go. So on, on March 5th of 1770, these tensions boiled over into what we now call the Boston Massacre. 
And following the massacre, British troops that had been stationed in Boston were removed to Castle William, which is present day Fort Independence on Castle Island, also part of the Boston, Boston Harbor Islands. So when Jane returned to Boston later in the spring of 1770, the town would have been embroiled over that investigation and trial of the soldiers involved in this so-called massacre. But if Jane had any thoughts on the matter, they have not survived for the historic record. So for the next two years, tensions kind of eased in the absence of the soldiers, but they really picked up in 1773 when Parliament passed the Tea Act. Now, this act was really not supposed to be controversial. It was intended to reduce tea smuggling and boost the sales of legally imported tea into the American colonies by the East India Company. And in reality, it actually lowered the overall price of tea. But the issue was that smuggling tea into the colonies was a really big business. And many of the richest merchants in Boston, including John Hancock, had made their fortunes smuggling tea. So it was these wealthy merchants who had a financial interest in seeing the Tea Act repealed who rallied Bostonians into thinking that this tax was a threat to their liberties. But the fact of the matter really was that a good portion of Boston's population, including Jane Maycomb, would never have been able to afford that luxury of tea. But this public outcry against tea did have a slight benefit for Jane because her fellow colonists were no longer boycotting all imported English goods and they were only focused on the tea, she thought that she might have another chance at her millinery business. So she wrote to her brother again and let him know that she wanted to try this small business, her millinery business, a second time. And this time she ordered about 50 pounds worth of fashionable English goods through her brother to sell in Boston and today that would be worth a few thousand dollars. And her business this time around was okay, but she didn't really make a significant amount of money, really only enough to get by. So after the Boston Tea Party took place on December 16th, 1773, Parliament passed the Intolerable Acts, which included the Boston Port Act, a piece of legislation that closed the port of Boston making it really difficult for Jane to import additional millinery supplies. And to enforce the Intolerable Acts, soldiers were ordered back into the city to occupy it once again. And with the troops returned to the town, the old hostilities between Bostonians and British soldiers picked up almost exactly where they had left off. And with these increased hostilities, Jane herself was still uncertain where her personal allegiance lay. Was she loyal to the crown or a supporter of the Patriot cause? When she heard rumors that her brother had been offered a crown position, she actually wrote to him almost immediately as soon as she heard this information to see if it was true. Because while she was always hopeful that her brother would do well for himself, um, especially since he was her only surviving sibling, she was also really concerned about his welfare if he openly allied himself with the crown in this time of turmoil. Additionally, her deceased son's widow, named Catherine, had gotten remarried to a British officer by the name of Thomas Turner. So she wrote to her brother about Ensign Turner, saying, he takes a good deal of pains to convince us he is a friend to the country, having been here formerly and kindly treated. But on the opposite side of the matter, at least two of her surviving children had or would ally themselves with the Patriots. Her daughter, Jane, nicknamed Jenny, had married a ship's captain, Peter Collis, and Peter Collis would openly ally himself with the Patriot cause, but he would be rather unlucky and Peter would be captured and held prisoner no less than three times during the Revolutionary War. And Jane's son, Josiah, enlisted in the Continental Army pretty much as soon as it was formed. And unfortunately, both Jane's son, Josiah, and her daughter-in-law's husband, Ensign Turner, would be casualties of the Battle of Bunker Hill. 
So after the first shots of the American Revolution were fired at Lexington and Concord in, on April 19th of 1775, the Continental Army began to lay siege to Boston uh, later that year, in July of that year. And Jane had a pretty difficult decision to make. She could stay in the town of Boston and essentially ally herself with the British, or she could leave and officially choose to support the Patriot cause. And in the end, she made the very difficult decision to flee. And she left most of her meager belongings behind, but she did manage to smuggle out some key items, including the remainder of her small business goods, as well as some books and papers, the most important of which were letters that she had kept from her brother, and of course, her book of ages. And initially, Jane went to Cambridge, Massachusetts, and then went to Rhode Island, where she stayed with one of her brother's friends, which means that at 63 years old, Jane Maycomb was a refugee. And she was actually one of 12,000 people who fleed Boston, leaving only about 3,000 in the town, most of them loyalists, but some who couldn't afford or couldn't manage to get out. So, as a result of the Revolutionary War, Jane Maycomb would remain a refugee for nearly a decade. And she moved from safe house to safe house, staying with various friends and family members, some of them actually as far away as Pennsylvania, as you can see on this map. And she tried to contribute to the war effort as best she could, but with her meager means, there wasn't much she could do. Uh, but she definitely was overjoyed when news reached her that France had officially allied themselves with the Continental Army. And she wholeheartedly celebrated when they landed on the shores of Rhode Island in 1780. So by that point, really no one would have been able to question where her loyalties lay. And Jane Maycomb finally returned to Boston in 1784, about a year after the Treaty of Paris was signed, uh, which officially ended the Revolutionary War. And she moved into a house on Unity Street. It was actually a house that had once been the home of one of her sisters who had died almost two decades before. And her brother, who indeed had been able to do well for himself, actually set up an annuity for her to ensure that she was well taken care of, even in the event that he would predecease her. Now, Jane's brother, had been a central figure of her life, despite him running away from home when she was only 11 and them only seeing each other about once every 10 years. Without him, she likely would have ended up in a poorhouse or in debtor's prison, just like her husband had. So you may be wondering who exactly was her brother and how did he manage to escape the life that his 16 siblings had not? So you may have noticed that throughout this presentation, I never referred to Jane's family name, only her married one. So without further ado, I will tell you, Jane Maycomb's maiden name was actually Franklin. So the brother that she was writing to and who had helped her with her business ventures and supported her in later life was indeed Benjamin Franklin. So despite running away from home, when he was 17 and only visiting home every decade or so, Ben Franklin was Jane's closest friend and confidant. In the earliest letters that, or earliest letter that survives in Ben Franklin's hand, he calls Jane his ever peculiar favorite. And years later, he also once told her that as the numbers of brethren and sister lessen, the affections of those of us that remain should increase to each other. And Ben Franklin was really the one who had encouraged Jane to learn to read and write. He supplied many of the books that made up her small library, and he had bought the supplies for her two business ventures while he was living in England. And most incredibly, Jane even went to stay with Franklin in Philadelphia in the summer of 1776 while she was still a refugee. So this means that she was staying with Ben Franklin while he was on that committee of five working on the Declaration of Independence. And something that I found incredibly interesting and beautiful even is that 
Franklin even asked Jane to make their family soap recipe for him while he was in France working as a diplomat so that he could distribute distribute it to his acquaintances there in an effort to support that kind of humble folksy portrayal of himself that really endeared him to the French court and this helped him solidify that relationship that would really encourage the French to enter the war on the side of independence. So the reason that we know anything about Jane Maycomb, this perfectly ordinary everyday person who lived through the American Revolution is because of her famous brother. And Jane Maycomb may not have had quite as much of a direct impact on the course of history as her famous brother did, but she really did believe that everyone had a purpose, even if they didn't know what it was or what it would be. So in a letter to her brother that she wrote when she was 74 years old, she said, I tell you these things that you may see, I do enjoy life here. But truly, my dear brother, I am willing to depart out of it whenever my great benefactor has no further use for me. For though but little of that appears to me now, I know the most insignificant creature on earth may be made of some use in the scale of beings, may touch some spring or verge to some wheel unperceived by us. Jane Franklin Maycomb died on May 7th, 1794. She was survived by only one of her 12 children, her daughter Jane, also known as Jenny Collis. And her brother, Benjamin, had predeceased her, passing away on April 17th, 1790. Now, Benjamin Franklin's funeral was actually attended by over 20,000 people and thousands of people still continue to visit his grave each year to this day. On the flip side, Jane Maycomb's grave is lost to history with no record of ever any stone ever being made for her. And therefore there's no physical marker left behind of her life. So what did Jane leave behind for us? What she did leave behind is a glimpse into what life must have been like for most people who lived through the American Revolution, and therefore a legacy of even how the most ordinary of everyday people have their role to play in history, and that even the most insignificant creature on earth may be made of some use. And this legacy helps give a voice to all of the poor widowed American women who were unable to leave their own records of their lives and experiences during the great American Revolution. And uh, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, um, the information from regarding uh, Jane Maycomb pretty much is based off of only four sources, the scholarship of historians, Carl Van Doren, Jeremy Stern, Jill Lepore, and Richard Bell. So they're really the only people who have uncovered and compiled a significant amount of information about this woman who would otherwise be a footnote in history. So with that, I think we can start the Q&A session. Awesome. <clears throat> well, thank you, Jane. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And clearly by some of the comments in the chat, you can see that uh, the surprise reveal at the end was a, uh, was a great way to leave it off to not you know, focus on Benjamin Franklin or bring him up until the end of the presentation. That was that was well done and well structured. Um, so do have a couple of questions in the chat and folks, please feel free to drop additional questions in the chat as we go here. Um, but the first question uh, I wanted to ask, I think it's a 
probably a fairly simple, you know, yes or no question. Um, did Jane move into the Clo House near Old North Church, uh, Christ Church? And if you don't know, that's that's totally fine. No. So the house that she lived in, I believe, was right next door to it and was demolished some time ago. Um, I think there might even be a plaque there saying like nearby is the house once owned by Benjamin because Ben Franklin did actually buy the house for his sister. So I think there is some note there um, saying that this is where she once lived, but it's not actually that house. It's one that's been demolished for quite some time. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Stop the screen share. Perfect. Um, great. Okay. So then next question. Um, do you know if the Townshend Acts were the spark slash inciting event that led to the women initiating spinning wheels and making clothes as a symbol to support the revolution and not purchase British goods? Um, I don't know if it is the, but it definitely was a supporting factor you know, kind of sparking that form of protest and, you know, providing a way for women to show that they supported this revolutionary movement. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, and then how much uh, did Jane interact with Deborah Franklin? Um, did she ever comment about her? And that's kind of both ways, either or. Yeah, um, so they actually corresponded, um, not nearly as much as Jane corresponded with her brother, but Jane felt a close friendship with Deborah um, when she was um, out of New England that first time in the winter of uh, 1769 into the spring of 1770. She actually stayed with Deborah for a while, even though her brother wasn't at home in Philadelphia. Um, so she actually went to stay with her sister-in-law and made friends in Philadelphia and really enjoyed her time living with her sister-in-law. And they did have a long friendship and correspondence. Great. Um, could Someone was asking if you could share uh, your source for the information about the Boston Tea Party. Um, they're just really interested in feel it's a very relevant event for today especially because we are coming up on the 250th anniversary of that i agree it is very very relevant um honestly i'm not sure that i had any particular source that i would recommend um i grew up in new england and i just know way too much about the american revolution and the boston tea party so i think that anything that's general american revolution is just stuff that I've been steeped in, no pun intended when it comes to tea. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't really have any particular source to point you to there because it's just part of who I am. And, uh, you know, it's what we talk about in the national parks just so often, so. Yeah, no, absolutely. I do, I'm dropping a, just a title of a book in the chat that I know that we use at the park. Um, yeah, no, no problem. Defiance of the Patriots, the Boston Tea Party and the Making of America uh, by Ben Karp. I'm actually currently reading this book myself. So um, that that is one source that you could, you could definitely consult. Um, so let me see here. I know that I saw one more, I apologize. Um, how would you describe Jane's religious beliefs? Was she a member of what we, uh, what we know as Old North Church? So she did live right at the base of Christ Church or Old North Church, but she did not attend there. Um, she would, is what we might call a, a Puritan today. She attended the Brattle Street Church. Um, I'm pretty sure that's the only one she really ever attended when she lived in Boston, but I know in Jill Lepore's book, Book of Ages, The Life and Opinions of Jane Franklin, um, Jill Lepore makes uh, a point of saying that um, Jane did not attend Old North Church, even though she lived right there and probably would have been very convenient for her to uh, attend that um, congregation. Great. Um, do you, do you know, uh, when the Makem family came to America and where they came from? 
so the the Maycomb family as in um like Jane's husband's family yes I do not um and I'm not sure really even where I might start looking for that um you know I didn't think to look into that at all because I wanted this to be all about Jane and um you know only mentioned her husband very briefly and all of that um but like I did say at the beginning of the presentation his family was even more poor and obscure than her own so um you know that that's going to be difficult I think to dig up too much about the the Maycombs um heritage yeah no that's that's that is understandable and uh so um I'm wondering so you you focused on you and what did you say the church that she attended um was only you only have record of the Brattle Street Church yes. is that is that correct yeah, yeah. okay we had another question if they had if she, we knew she attended Old South Meeting House because the yeah. friend with you there but so I actually can speak to that a little bit um yes her family did attend Old South Meeting House but once Jane was old enough to choose a church that she wanted to attend, she chose Brattle Street. So she did grow up um, going to Old South Meeting House, but um, her uncle actually was a member of Brattle Street Church and she really adored her uncle and kind of idolized him, honestly. And so, like I said, when she was old enough to make that choice for herself, uh, she ended up attending there. And I believe that was also the church that her husband initially went to. Um, again, not too, too much information is out there about Jane's early life, but that may have even been where Jane ended up meeting her husband, if I remember correctly. Great. Um, so I think we have time for one more. So I'll, I'll share this one uh, from the chat. Um, did Jane ever comment on her brother's diplomatic or political activities? Um, for example, like the Declaration of Independence, et cetera? Um, so she definitely referenced her brother's works when talking to her friends and, um, you know, talking to him. Uh, she was very aware of what he was doing or as aware as she could be because when he was in France, um, there were there was actually a period of at least a year, it might have been two, where he didn't send her any letters. Um, but she also was in the same social circles as um, John Adams and a handful of the other diplomats. So she did get news about him and what he was doing. And so she did definitely comment on them, um, just not publicly. So like I said, she, she was very private about these things, but she was incredibly proud of her brother. She loved him. She wanted to see him succeed. She was always very, very happy, happy for his achievements. Um, she even tried with her very meager means to get hands on any of his publications. Um, I think that's the only book of hers that survives is one of his publications. I think it might even be one of his first ones on electricity, if I remember correctly. Um, so she absolutely loved him and was so proud of him. And part of the reason that I felt so driven to create a presentation that was focused solely on Jane, unlike any of the other publications you read about, is because Ben Franklin in his autobiography doesn't mention her a single time. So, I really felt compelled to tell her story without having him be a part of it, even though she loved him. Um, I kind of wanted to even the score a little bit on that front. Well, there you go. Um, that's great. Uh, did have one final question, uh, which we will address and then can turn it back over to Karen. Um, so Jane was an avid reader. Um, could you talk just a little bit about some of the books that she enjoyed reading? Sure. So I actually have Jill Lepore's book with me because I figured I would get some, some questions about that sort of stuff. And Very well um, annotated, I see. <laughs> honestly, this book is great. Um, this isn't an official endorsement by the Park Service by any means, but if you want to learn more about Jane, 
Um, this book by Jill Lepore is um, really the only full length book that you will find about Jane um, as well. So um, Jill Lepore did actually make a list of Jane's little library. And I'll just poke through here quick to find it. I, at this point, have too many sticky notes in it. So um, here we go. So obviously the big one is the Bible. Um, she clearly read that, referenced it dozens and dozens of times. Um, the Boston Gazette was another one, not a book per se, but, um, um, but um, an author that you might recognize, Daniel Defoe, um, especially an essay upon projects. Uh, Jonathan Edwards is another one. Um, and all of her brother's writings. Uh, so she really loved to read anything written, written by Ben Franklin. Um, Arthur Lee, um, Alexander Pope, I know she references in her letters a handful of times. Um, Thomas Paine, she read Common Sense, of course. Uh, John Perkins, Plutarch's Lives is another one that might um, be, be recognized to some people here. Uh, Richard Price, Joseph Priestley. Uh, so pretty much she read anything she could get her hands on. Um, Jonathan Swift as well. Um, so yeah, avid, avid reader. Um, at one point she wrote a letter to, I think it was to her brother. Most of her letters that survive are ones written to her brother. Um, she wrote, I read as much as I can. So she just really wanted to read anything she could get her hands on. And even with those incredibly full days, she made time at the end of every day to try and read at the very least the Bible. But, you know, if she could sneak in a, a novel or something fun, then she would. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's advice I could use today. Um, well, Thank you so much, Jane. Um, you know, I think that was a, a really eye-opening and fantastic presentation. Uh, obviously, a lot of hard work and research went into that. So really appreciate you pulling it together in a concise, uh, clear way, which was reflected in the comments here. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you. And I will turn it over to Karen to close us out. Um, not once. Can you mention her once? Like once? In a giant book, this giant life. We learned about kites. We learned about electricity. We learned about liberty. Not Jane. That's cool. <laughs> um, but I'm so happy you went on a deep dive because honestly, I'm going to keep going. I absolutely obsessed with your entire presentation. It was absolutely fantastic. And the reveal at the end. Oof, so, good. so thank you again. And thank you for your brilliant work. Um, and I hope everyone joins us uh, in two weeks when it is uh, a talk about environmental justice in the Boston Harbor Islands. Thank you again and uh, have, a, have a nice night. The light's still out. Thank you, everyone.